So in my video on how I use code as an astrophysicist, I made a list of five ways that I use code on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, technically the fifth thing on my list, which was writing computer simulations of the universe is not something that I do. I instead go to telescopes and take data and that's how I do my science. But someone who is an expert on this is one of my best friends from my PhD, Dr. Ricarda Beckman, who is now a research fellow at the University of Cambridge and an expert on writing and running simulations on how black holes grow. So I rang her up so we could chat about how she uses code in her work. And some of that chat made it into that main video on how I use code. But for those of you who want it, here is the full original unedited version of that chat. So enjoy. So how do you go about coding up something as complex as a black hole? So if you want to do a, a simulation of pretty much anything like a black hole or a galaxy or any other phenomenon, the key thing to think about really is the underlying physics. So we very much have to think back to sort of the, the parts or the components that are of physics that are relevant in this particular context. Uh, and then we um, think about how to translate the physical laws uh, into some sort of computer algorithm. So for example, if I work with um, black holes a lot and I want to study say the evolution of gas near a black hole what I'll do is I'll have to think about the gas physics so I have to think about okay how does a gas behave say when the pressure changes what happens to it if you cool it or if you heat it how does it you know move and evolve over time so it will code up all these different sort of reactions on physical phenomena that go on at the same time and then I have to think about the black hole and go okay so what does the black hole contribute to the situation and for example with black holes it's typically the gravity that's the important part so I will code up the laws of gravity um, and then I can put all of this together and really study how a gas evolves under the gravity of a black hole and how the gas physics sort of evolve in this context. So that's really how we put together a simulation. Now, obviously, there's an awful lot of physics out there. And in many situations, part of the reason simulations are so good is because we can put all these different components together in a way that, you know, would be far too complicated if you tried doing it, you know, separately. So what we do is we build these very big codes that have all these different parts of physics in it. So I don't do all of this myself. Um, a lot of these codes are the code I work with, for example, was started about 20 years ago or so, and there's a whole community working on it. And everybody sort of adds, you know, new physics when they think, well, not when they think of something, but when something new um, sort of seems um, important to be added to the code, everybody adds bits, I've added bits, you know, my colleagues have added bits. And, but I also still use things people put in a long time ago. So basically, we've sort of collectively built this incredible, powerful software machinery to do these simulations. That's so cool that you leave your own little contribution as well, like in the history of the field, I guess, even like students in 20 years time or researchers in 20 years time might be using like a little bit that you added. Right, exactly. So, you know, if it goes well, then, uh, and if that's still a, a phenomenon they're interested in at the time and that's relevant for their physics, they will just use yeah, my code, the bit I added and sort of, so I do my own work, but I also contribute to the sort of future of the field in a sense. So what language do you actually use to code up like the laws of physics into this? Like what's the, the best one for this application? So it depends a little bit on which part of it. So really with doing simulations, there's actually more like two very uh, parallel uh, things we have to do. So the first thing we have to actually do the simulation and then we have to take the data produced by the simulation and sort of analyze and visualize and study it. And we use two different coding languages for the two different purposes. Um, so for actually running the simulations, this is um, what we call high performance computing. So it's computationally very expensive. You need very big supercomputers to do it. So the important thing here is to have a language that's efficient. So, you know, any amount of computational time, energy we can save in this is, is good. So we tend to work with all the more formalized languages in a sense. So I personally use Fortran, for example. Um, so these are ones that, that it's maybe a little more difficult to code, but because it's code we write once very carefully and then use many, many times, these sort of efficiency gains we get out of the language are really important and really worth it. So that's sort of the actual simulation code. But then once we got all this data, we need to go and look at it, analyze it, study it, you know. Um, and for that, I use Python because the point there is that we want to write quick code. We want to have, you know, be able to something that's intuitive. I want to be able to put something together and, you know, follow through on an idea really quickly. And I know you've talked about earlier about Python a lot. So I think for the exact same reasons, we, we use it for the analysis as well. Yeah, it's kind of like parallel, isn't it? The same way that I would analyze an image, you would analyze sort of the output output image, if you will, from a simulation, right, in the, in the right. same way. It's so powerful, Python, that it can do so much like that. That's why exactly. I like Do you have a favorite? Like, do you prefer Fortran or Python? 
I think from a coding point of view, I definitely prefer Python. I find Python quite intuitive. It's very powerful. There's a huge amount of things that people have already done out there, which I can benefit from. Um, Fortran is much simpler in the sense that it has very strict rules, but you have to you know, stick to them. And you're much more limited what you do, so you end up just coding a lot of things from scratch. Right? In Python, you just sort of import a function and it does it. In Fortran, you have to sit down and code it yourself. Okay. So it's just more involved. <laughs> I always find that the, the old Fortran code I've seen is all written in capital letters, so it just looks like it's yelling at you when you write Fortran code. <laughs> Thankfully, the one I use is not all in capitals. I think yeah. that would really stress me out. <laughs> so. Especially when it's like black holes as well, like yelling code about black holes. But the one I use is actually built, was originally built by a French community. So I do still come across bits of random French in there. So every so often I have to sort of go and Google what, what the comment next to the code is trying to tell me because I'm like, I don't understand what this is. So. I love it. I guess the big question though is why do we actually run simulations? Like why are simulations so important in astrophysics? The reason simulations are so important is because uh, in astrophysics, we have a few very particular challenges in this sort of particular science. So one of them is that it's awfully hard to do experiments because, you know, there's only one universe. It's really big. The time scales over which things evolve are incredibly long. So from observational point of view, we often just get the sort of individual snapshots of objects. And the powerful thing about simulations is that it makes these big time scales and these big length scales very tractable because we can essentially put together these simulations, which, you know, a big simulation will just look like a movie of an object evolving over giga years of time and you can watch it in five minutes. So basically this gives us a chance to sort of build these evolution histories and then link that to the observations to see whether what we get out looks like what we think it should look like, like the observations. Um, and that allows us to sort of test whether the physics we put in originally, where, what I talked about earlier, really is all the relevant physics. If it looks like what we'd expected to, um, then we think we've understood it. If it doesn't look like what we'd expected to, then we have to go back and sort of, you know, go back and check our understanding. What did we miss? What did we maybe misunderstand? Where could the sort of, you know, di discrepancy come from? So really they're a way to test our understanding, but also to sort of, you know, get full sort of long-term evolution histories of things that otherwise might be much more difficult to study. Mm. Yeah, it's funny because when you read like different studies and, and some people phrase it as like, oh, the observations don't match the simulations. As if there's right. like some something wrong with the observations, like is there some bias in simulations of the truth? And then there are other people who write it, well, the simulations don't match the observations and it's the observations that are the truth and we need to make the simulations match. Right. But it, it's so funny when you, when you think about like, which one is it? Is it something we're missing or is there something how we can't quite see what's going on in the observations. Like it, it's a yeah. weird one, isn't it? It is a weird one. And I think, it, I mean, you know, I think the, the way of saying the simulations don't match the observations is probably the cor correct way around because there's only one real universe and everything else is in a sense artificial or it's rather our understanding of the universe put together, which, you know, isn't necessarily correct. But the thing that simulations can be very good at is they can also add information you could never get from an observation, for example. Mm -hmm we can directly deal with things like dark matter. So we can look at then we see the stars in the universe and we see the stars in the simulation, we can compare these and then we can extrapolate from the simulations what some of the components we can't see, such as the dark matter, for example, are doing in particular environments. So they can be very good at adding supplementary information because they're sort of just much more approachable in some ways than the real universe. Mm. It must be a nightmare though if you're like, oh, it doesn't match. So let's change this one thing and see if it makes a difference oh, I have to wait weeks to find yeah. out if it worked. Is that how it is? So like, is it actually weeks or is it more like days? I mean, sometimes it's years if you have a really big simulation. But the problem then is it's not so much necessarily that you go and rerun it. It's more that you, there's, there's sort of an art to taking the information you have and it, extracting the information you are missing. Or rather, so basically, you can gain a lot of info understanding even from a simulation that you know to a certain extent is wrong. Because it's about quantifying in which way it's not correct. Uh, which then will give you, you know, it's not like you have to go back and just try something else. It's we usually very carefully work out what we think it was that was missing from the missing information and that we have. And then we can go back and very specifically do, for example, a little test run to see whether it's better. So that might be a few hours instead of going back and doing the whole thing again. That would take a huge amount of time and effort. Yeah. So it's only when we're very certain we got a better version that we go back and right. <laughs> the full thing. <laughs> so, yeah, the I, time scales can be very long. So I remember finding like an error in my code during my PhD. And like being like, yeah. oh, it's so annoying. I have to rerun. And it maybe took like a couple of days. And I was like, oh, it's so inconvenient. Like, have you ever found like an error either in your code or like in code that's been in the simulation for years, maybe it's been contributed by somebody else that you've been like, oh no. <laughs> like, yeah. 
Definitely. I mean, I still have simulations left over from my PhD that I know are wrong and I haven't figured out to fix them. So I basically have a whole paper written, but I know the simulation underlying it is not as reliable as I would like it to be. It's probably fine, but an important part of it is I need to be confident that what I'm putting out into science is something I'm willing to stand behind and say, I think this is right, you know, within the context that I put it into. So a lot of it is sort of getting to the point where you have to make sure you understand what's going on. So even if it doesn't look like you expect it to, you need to understand why that is. That's really where the science comes in. And then that's the distinguishing feature. Is this physics or is this just I coded it wrong? Um, and I personally don't put out a simulation, but I'm not 100% certain that it's physics and not mm. me coding it wrong. And sometimes you get something where you've done it and you go, oh no, I coded it wrong. You go back and redo it. Yeah, <laughs> that's just the just way it life, is. just life, right? Like it's scientists are only human. <laughs> We're only <Right>. human. <laughs> and can I ask, what is it actually, because I work quite independently in terms of my code, it's like literally just me. What is it actually like working in like a big collaboration in terms right. of like, we all work on a code together. Like what's that like? Um, so it's actually still, from a personal point of view, fairly independent. So I have my own version of the code that, you know, is hosted on my laptop, is hosted on the computers I work with. Uh, and I will decide I want to add a new feature. I don't know, at the moment I'm working a lot on magnetic um, conduction. So that's a particular part of physics that wasn't included in the code beforehand. So I will sit down and I will write code for this. I will test it. I will run simulations. I will put, to, you know, I'll discuss it with other people who might be in the collaboration, but ultimately Typically, I develop something new myself. Uh, and then there's somebody who sort of looks after the central version of the code, so to speak. So when I think I'm done, I take my version of the code and I hand it back to the central version and they then incorporate my changes into the big version, if that makes sense, into, into the sort of central repository. Uh, and then anybody else who wants to get it just goes to that central version and downloads a copy of it. It's nice to know that everyone can like come together and work together to create something, you know, as like complex as simulating the entire universe. Because I guess it feels overwhelming. Like, who was the first? Who was the first person that just like sat down and was like, "Right, time to start a simulation of the universe." Like that must have been so like. <gasps> you know where do you start yeah i think it was somebody's phd project he's now a professor about well, the code i work with he's now a professor in uh, in zurich so you know his his entire career has been this code and he started it he published the original paper that said here's a new code and then people have been building on it ever since that's so cool so. thanks ricardo <laughs> it was really great to speak you're to very you. welcome <laughs>